some options for how we can talk more about this. I have no lunch plans. Let's uh, have an ES6 table in the cafeteria. Just grab me, and if you want to talk about this stuff, I'd be glad to talk about it over lunch. I don't have dinner plans tonight. If you want to go to dinner somewhere and talk about ES6, that's fine. You don't even have to pay for my dinner. I'd be happy just to talk about this. And one last really exciting option, meet me in front of the Double Tree Hotel at 6.30 tomorrow morning and go for a five-mile run with me, and we'll talk about ES6 while we're running. <laughs> uh, maybe you're too fast for me or vice versa. We can work that out, but let me, let me know if you want to. 7.30? Can we do that? <laughs> No, can't do 8.30. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to uh, do any of those things with, uh, with you. All right, well maybe because I have so much to get through, not quite fair to the people that thought I was gonna start at 10.30, but I think I'm gonna jump in anyway and get through as much of this as I can. Uh, my slides are available on my website right now, which is ociweb.com slash mark. And when you get to that page, just search for Midwest JS. There's lots of other uh, articles and slide presentations that I've done uh, that might be of value to you there. And also there's my email address if you want to contact me about anything. Uh, so uh, ECMAScript 6, or as it's now called, 2015, is designed by a technical committee of ECMA called TC39. And uh, a lot of the features that are in uh, ECMAScript 2015 are really syntactic sugar over things that you could already do but there's an easier, more concise way to do it now. Some of the features are there to make JavaScript be a better target for compiling from other languages to JavaScript. And so I've tried to mark some of those things, especially the ones that are syntactic sugar. You'll see a sugar packet in the corner of the slide. One thing that's really noticeable about this version of JavaScript is that the spec just really ballooned. Uh, the previous version was 258 pages, and now this new version, 566 pages. So a lot of new features, and you've probably heard about this. The future plans are to have a new release of the spec every year. So next year we'll have ES 2016 with a much smaller set of new features than we saw this time, and I think that's a good idea. So there are a lot of options that you can use for taking advantage of, uh, and I'll call it ES 6 for short for, for the rest of the talk. Uh, to take advantage of that now, even though the browsers don't fully support all of this yet. So what you want to do is use a transpiler that will take your new code and transpile it to ES5 code that runs in current browsers. And there are a lot of options, but three really notable ones. So there is Babel and Tracer that is from Google, and then there's TypeScript from Microsoft. And the percentages that you see after these names are the percentage of the ES6 features that they support. And uh, so you could pick kind of based on that. Uh, another distinction is that I've found that Tracer transpiles a bit faster than Babel. That could be an issue for you if you've got a really large application. And then TypeScript is a funny thing. It transpiles some ES6 features to ES5, but not all. And even more surprisingly, they don't even have that as a goal to do it for all of them. And so the ones that they've chosen not to handle for you, what they're saying is just tell TypeScript to target ES6, generate that, and so you still get the benefit of types in your code if you want that, and then use one of the other transpilers, Babel or Tracer, to take it from that to ES5, and now you've got a two-step process. But uh, that is one option to consider. And so how do you find out what features are supported by these transpilers or by specific browsers? Well, this is a great website to go to for this. If you just Google for Kangax, you'll probably end up here. It's the compatibility table. And you can see that you could look at compatibility for ES5 and 6 and 7. And then down the side, you see a list of features. And many of these have some kind of subparts. And so if you click the little triangle, it opens up and it shows you specifically what parts of that feature they support. Another thing to note is that this is testing for the existence of a feature, but not necessarily that it conforms to the spec. Uh, so you have to uh, look at this in, in some detail. Uh, but you can see here, I, I know you can't read this from where you are, but for example, here's tracer and here's rest parameters and it says four slash five. And that means that there are five aspects to this feature and tracer implements four of the five. And so if I expanded this, I could see which one it was missing. 
So the rest of this talk, I'm going to be going over various features uh, in uh, ES6. And we'll start with block scope. And this is kind of one of the really obvious ones that you'd like to have. And if you've been doing JavaScript for a while, you know that what sets the scope for a variable is the function that it's inside. Not a block like curly braces that go to an if statement. But all that changes now with ES6. We now have block scope. And so the block is what defines the scope of a thing. In addition, you can use let and const as a replacement for var, and you really should do that. Uh, those things are have block scope, whereas var, the old way, does not have that. Uh, const, uh, as you might guess, means that you can't modify this. Of course, if you make a variable const and it refers to an object, that just means you can't change it to refer to a different object, but you can still get to the properties inside and change those. Functions and class definitions are block scope. So if I declare a function inside a block of an if statement, I can only use it there. Uh, and then last, you've probably used an immediately invoked function execution or an ify to give you a scope before. And there's really no need to do that anymore. You could just use curly braces. That makes a scope. And so that makes it a bit shorter. And the, the quick example here is just showing a few uses of let and const and showing that it's an error to try to change a constant. It's an error to refer to something before it's defined. Default parameters. So when I'm declaring the parameters of a function, I can give them default values. And those default values can be an expression, not just a constant value. And so in this example, you see I'm creating a data object. And then I'm calling methods on that data object to give me what I want the defaults to be for some of these parameters. And so the month defaults to the current month. The year defaults to the current year. And then I have various calls to that where I'm omitting some of the parameters and taking the default value. Um, an interesting thing here is that the default value expressions can refer to earlier parameters. And so their default value can be based on another parameter. You also can explicitly pass undefined for a parameter to ask for the default value. And I don't have an example of a call like that here. But suppose I wanted the default value for month, but I wanted to specify the year. Well, I don't have a default for day, so I have to pass day. And then I would pass undefined for the month and then a specific year. And because the month was undefined, it would then use the default value. That makes it OK to uh, have parameters with default values that come before other ones that don't. In most languages that have default parameters, you can't do that. And then an interesting thing that you can do with this is if you want to say a parameter is required and you'd like to throw an error if it isn't supplied, well, you could just set the default value to be a call to a function where all it does is throws. And then if you call this and you don't specify a value for that, it's going to then uh, evaluate that expression, which throws. So it's an interesting way to enforce required parameters. So rest operator is a way of gathering up all the extra parameters at the end. It's an alternative to using the arguments object that you may have used in the past. And it's a good replacement for that. And what's really nice about it is that it is a real array, not just an array-like thing. And also, if you don't supply the extra parameters, what you get is an empty array, not undefined. And so it's more uh, consistent to work with. So in this example, I'm expecting a first name and a last name to be passed in, and then as many colors as you want to specify. And inside, I'm checking to see how many colors I got. And if I didn't get any, then I want to tack on to the end of, uh, or I want to set phrase to be no colors. And if you gave me one, I'll say the color and that. And if I got more, then I'm going to join them all together with the word and and print out an appropriate phrase. OK, so rest parameter is a great way to gather up a variable number of uh, arguments at the end. The spread operator, in some sense, is kind of the reverse of uh, the rest operator. And it spreads out elements of anything that is iterable. And we're going to be talking much more about iterables toward the end of my talk today. Uh, but for now, uh, you could just uh, think about arrays and strings as being things that are iterable. I can iterate through the elements of an array or the characters inside a string. Uh, and so there are uh, two main uses of this. One is to take an array and spread it out as individual arguments to a function. Another is to 
add an array to another array and spread the elements out in place inside it. And so the first case we see here is that I've got two arrays and I'd like to take all the elements in the second one and add them to the end of the first. Well, the old way of doing that is to go to that array and grab its push method and then apply it back to that same object and apply takes as its second argument an array of the uh, values that will be passed to that method. That's uh, not very readable. A, a better thing in ES6 is to call push and use the spread operator. So this is just as if I had taken all the individual elements of the array, specified them as separate arguments in that call. Uh, here we see that I ha happen to have a bunch of my data in an array and I want to create a date. Well, this date constructor requires that I pass those as separate arguments. The spread operator can do that for me. And finally, here I have an array and I'd like to insert this one into the middle of this new array that I'm going to create. And I can use the spread operator right in the middle and it basically explodes that array and it creates what I want. Uh, notice the sugar packet on this slide and many of the previous ones. It's not that you couldn't do these things before, it's just this is a nicer, more concise way to do it. Okay, next big topic is destructuring. Destructuring also works with things that are iterable like arrays and strings. And so what you do here is you put an iterable thing on the right hand side of an assignment and then on the left you say how you want to extract some things out of it. And there are two forms of this. There's positional destructuring and object destructuring. So in positional, I have an array specified on the left side and I'm not creating an array, I'm just specifying positions within the iterable on the right that I want to extract uh, elements from. And so in that first example, I'm grabbing the first two elements out of that iterable. In the next example, I'm grabbing the third and the fifth. So by the commas, I can uh, say that I don't care about some of the things and specify just the positions that I want. Then in object destructuring, uh, you have some object on the right hand side and on the left side you have something that looks like an object but really I'm just specifying variables that I want to set to values of properties that come out of the object on the right side. So the keys that I specify here are the names of properties I want to get out of that object and the values are names of variables that I want to set. Now uh, often there's one really good name for a thing and so I really want to create a variable that has the same name as the property. And so in that case, I don't have to repeat myself there. I can just omit that. And so this says I'm creating a variable that's called prop1, and I'm expecting there's a property in this object also called prop1. And so it grabs the value and sets those variables. Uh, so there are a lot of places where you can use destructuring. You can use it when you are declaring variables or when you're ex assigning to existing variables. We haven't seen an example like that just yet. Uh, you could use it in parameter lists to say that uh, I'm passing in an obje object like an array or an ordinary object into a function and I want to immediately extract some values out of it. And then last is the for of loop, which we're going to get to later. Now, if I started a line with a curly brace, it would think I was starting a block. But if what I'm really doing is destructuring into existing variables, I have to tell it that by surrounding the whole expression, the whole assignment inside paren. So you see the paren there and the paren there, and now I can do destructuring. And the way that this is different than this previous line is that this one assumed that var1 and var2, they haven't been declared yet. I need to declare them and I want to set them. But if they had already been declared and I just want to set them, then I have to do it this way. Uh, so the left hand side can be nested to any depth. I can have arrays of objects and objects that have values that are arrays, any combination you can think of. Uh, the left-hand side uh, variables can have default values. So if I don't find a match in the thing on the right, uh, it will take on the default value. And if I'm using positional destructuring, I can use the rest operator to say, I want to grab maybe some initial things out of this array and then just give me all the rest and put it in this new array that I'm going to create. And so in this example here, I'm grabbing the first thing out of uh, this iterable. And then all the rest are going to go into this variable called others, which is going to be an array. Okay. 
Uh, if I'm assigning to things rather than declaring new variables, then the things on the left-hand side that I'm assigning into don't have to just be names of variables. They can be something more complex, like a specific property of some existing object or an element of an existing array. I could extract some values out of something else and assign them into those. You can use destructuring to swap values, so I don't need a temporary variable to swap the values of these variables A and B, and I could have as many things in the, those uh, arrays as I want. One place where this is useful is writing a function that uh, returns multiple values, or uh, it seems to return multiple values. So what I would do is I would write it so that maybe it returns an array of three things, or it returns an object with multiple properties. But then when I call this function and I'm getting the result, I won't put it into a single variable that holds the array or the object. Instead, I'll immediately destructure the result and set a whole bunch of variables to the pieces of that that I really wanted. So here's some more examples of destructuring. In this first one, I have a, a deeply nested array, and I want to pick out specific things. And you can see the pattern on the left-hand side of the second line there, and you can see how the, the value 1 is going to go into A, and the 3 goes into the B, and the 4 goes into the C. Notice how I don't have a comma after the C to match up with the 5. I don't need that. I'm just saying grab the first thing out of the array that was in that position. And then the D, of course, is going to take on the value 8. And the two commas that come before the D are telling it that I don't care about the first and the second things in the array that's at that position. I just want the third thing. Uh, so it's very uh, pattern-oriented way of extracting values out of this deeply nested structure. You could do a similar thing with objects. So here I've got an object with three properties. I've got color, weight, and size. And let's say I want to extract out just the values of color and size. So I do that with this line right here. And because the name of the variable I want to set is the same as the name of the property I'm trying to extract, I just have to give the name. Okay. And finally, if I have a deeply nested object like this team example, and I've got a catcher and a pitcher, and I want to extract out just the name of the pitcher, I could do it like this. I'm destructuring from team and saying, find a thing inside called pitcher, and inside that, find the value for name. And what I've done here is I've uh, declared and initialized a variable called name. Now, I have not created a variable for pitcher, though, only for name. You print that out, and I get Adam Wainwright. Uh, and then finally, if I want to get both the pitcher name and the catcher name, I would do it like this. And notice in this example, I am giving the name of the variable I want to set. And I really have to because there's a name for the pitcher and there's a name for the catcher. I can't get both of them with the same name, so I have to say what it should assign to. And I'm printing those out. And by now, you know where I'm actually from, right? Who knows what city I'm from? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Another good example is uh, working with regular expressions. And you may be familiar with this exec method of regular expressions. And when I match against that date pattern, what I get back is an array where the first element is the whole match. And the rest of the elements are representing the parenthesized groups in my regular expression. So just the month, and just the day, and just the year. Well, suppose I just want the values of the parenthesized groups. Well, I could use destructuring and evaluate the regular expression. I get that array with the four things in it. And then I say, I really only care about the second and the third and the fourth piece. And please declare variables with those names and initialize them correctly. OK, and one final example. This is often useful when I have a, a function where I need to pass to it some kind of a configuration object. Basically, I want named parameters. And so what I'll do is I'll pass it an object where the keys are the names of the things that I want to specify. And so right in the uh, uh, parameter list, I can say that what you should pass me is one thing, an object that looks like this. It has a color and a size and a speed and a volume property. And by the way, if the object you give me doesn't have a speed property, I want it to be uh, defaulted to slow. So here I have a call to it. I pass these things in. 
And uh, w what it will print out here is what you see in the comments to the right, and I didn't specify a speed, and so that defaults to slow. So it's a great way for working with configuration kinds of objects. And the nice thing about this is that you don't care about the order in which you've specified these, because uh, order doesn't matter for object properties. Of all of the ES6 features, the one that I use the most often is arrow functions. Comes up all the time, because of course in JavaScript there are many cases where you have to pass a function to another function. So uh, arrow functions look like uh, what you see at the top there. And there are a lot of shortcuts to this. If your function only takes one parameter, you don't need the parens. And on the right side, if you only have one expression, you don't need the curly braces. And an extra magical thing is that often with these anonymous functions, what you really want to do is return some value. So if there's only one expression, you've omitted the curly braces, it automatically returns the value of that expression. So you don't even need the return keyword. Now, I think a lot of people, when they first look at this syntax, they think, well, I don't know about that rule where when I only have one parameter, I don't need the parens, because it turns out if you don't have any parameters, you need the parens. So the only time you can leave them off is when there's exactly one. And some people look at that and think, well, I'll just be consistent and I'll always use parens. But I want to encourage you not to do that. It seems that there's a strong convention already developing that uh, people really hate it when there's parens there, when there's only one parameter. And some linting tools will catch that. So that's just a thing to get used to. No parens when there's one parameter. Um, if the thing that you want to return, there's just one thing and it's an object, like a literal object, now you have an issue. Because when it sees the braces, it thinks, oh, you've got a block of code with a bunch of expressions, but you really just had a literal object. And so how do you do that? And the answer, yet again, is put parens around it. So when you're returning just a literal object, you have to put parens around the braces. Uh, inside an arrow function, the value of this is whatever it was outside the arrow function. And this is really great. It makes it so that you no longer have to say in your code uh, var self equals this or var that equals this so that you have a reference to that then you could use it inside an anonymous function. Uh, you won't need that because the arrow function doesn't change what the value of this is. Uh, so let's look at a couple of examples here. Here I've got an array at the top and I want to create a brand new array where all the values are doubled. And so I have a very uh, short, concise arrow function. It takes uh, one argument x and it returns x times two. Very simple. Uh, I could define a product function like this. It takes two parameters, an a and a b, and it returns their product. And there's an example of calling it. And now if I want to implement an average function, I could say it takes an array of numbers, and then first I'm going to add them up with reduce. And so here's a very short way of writing what my reduce function is going to be. And then I can divide by the length, and I've got my average. So I talked about lexical this. There's also lexical super, which you won't encounter quite as much. But where that comes into play is when you're working inside a class definition, which we'll be getting to. Um, if I'm inside a method or inside a constructor, uh, then the value of super inside one of these arrow functions is the same as it is outside, and that's very convenient as well. Symbols are a new primitive type added in ES6, and the way that you create a symbol is by saying symbol and you pass to it a description. So this is not a class. You don't use new symbol, and you can't do that. You just say symbol, call the symbol function, and pass it a description. And so what you're getting back is a thing that uh, is immutable, and it's unique. So every time I create another symbol, there's no way it's going to match any existing symbol. Uh, the uh, description isn't required. It's mainly there for debugging purposes. But if I want to retrieve it, I can call toString on a symbol and get that back. But it is a new primitive type. So if I ask for the type of sim there, it's going to say I'm a symbol. 
So this is what uh, might be called a local symbol. The spec doesn't call it that explicitly, but there's another kind called global. So with this local kind, the only way any other code is going to get access to that, to that is if I pass the symbol to them. But this other kind global, I create it with symbol.4, and if that symbol already existed with that description, it would give me back a reference to the existing one. Otherwise, it would create a new one and return that to me. And then later, I can get the description with symbol.key4. I think that you won't use those nearly as often as the uh, local kind of symbols. And so why do we want these things? Well, first off, they can be used as the key and an object. And so here's an example where I'm setting a, a key of some object, and it happens to be a symbol, and I can give it any value that I want. And when I do this, those become non-enumerable properties of the object. Now, it doesn't mean I can't get to them. I can call object.getOwnPropertySymbols and pass it an object, and it will give me reference to all the symbols. So it's not like a private or a hidden thing, but it's just different from all of the other keys of the object, which are strings. This is often used to uh, specify something that's kind of a meta-level property of an object uh, or something that's uh, uh, sort of internal to the operation of that object. And a good example of this is one that is uh, stored in, uh, in this property here. Symbol.iterator holds a reference to a predefined symbol and any class that wants to be iterable they just have to create a method that that is the name of the method. Well, there are a lot of these well-known symbols that are defined in the spec, and here's a list of all of them. And basically, if you uh, add a method to some class and you say that's the name of the method, the value of one of these symbols, it causes that thing to behave differently in specific contexts. And we don't have time to talk about each of these, but we're gonna see much more later about how symbol.iterator is used. Okay, so uh, one thing that's great about this is that if you come up with this new magical behavior that any object can have, as long as it has this special method, you don't have to worry that, oh, maybe they already use that name. There's no way they could have used that name because these symbols are unique. That's why it's better than just telling someone, well, if you write a method in your object that's called foo, and then you pass your object to me, I'll do this special thing. Instead, you want to say, here's a symbol, create a method whose name is this symbol, and then I'll do the special thing. Uh, no chance for collisions. Okay, next new feature, enhanced object literals. Um, if you have a variable whose name is the same as a property that you would like to add to some object, then when you create a literal object, you could just specify the key. You don't have to specify the key and the value. start with an empty object and then I can set a property on it where this is any expression I want. But in the new way, I could write it like this. The square brackets around the expression in the key position uh, mean the same thing. Oh, and I can also use this in a case where uh, this is going to be a symbol. And that's a useful thing to do with symbol.iterator as we'll see later. Uh, there's a new way of adding a method to a literal object. The old way of doing it, you see I'm defining this literal object and I've got the property number set to two, and I want to have a multiply method on this object. Well, uh, here's just an anonymous function. I pass in a number and I return uh, my number property in this object multiplied by two. But the new way to do it 
is to write it like this. And notice that I've gotten rid of the colon function space, and I just have the parameter list, and then curly braces. Now you might think, couldn't we make this even shorter by using an arrow function? And so you might uh, attempt to do something like that, that, but it turns out that does not work. And the reason is that this right here doesn't mean what you think it does. Here, this refers to whatever this was at the time it was uh, like parsing this code. And what this is at that point is whatever it was above the let line, which is not what you want. So you can't use an arrow function to define a method in some object. All right, let's talk about defining classes. And once again, this is just more syntactic sugar. There is still prototypal inheritance going on beneath the covers. It's just a nicer way to write it. And so here I'm defining a shoe class, and I can have one constructor, and the name of that thing is constructor. And so here I'm taking uh, three uh, parameters, a brand, a model, and a size, and I'm initializing all of those properties of this new object that I've created. And I also want to keep track of how many shoe objects I've created, and so I'm incrementing shoe.count. Do you see down here that I'm uh, creating what is essentially like a static property of this class? And I cannot do that inside the class body. That's unfortunate, but it's maybe something that they'll resolve in a future version of the language. However, I can have static methods. So here's an example of a static method. I want to know, have I created any shoes? And the answer is, is the shoe dot count greater than zero? Uh, then I want to be able to compare shoes. And as you know, there's not a standard method in JavaScript that you can add to an object that's used for uh, equality comparisons. But you might make one and call it equal. And so I'm deciding that the way I'll determine whether some object you've passed to me is the same as this one is first to see, is it a shoe object? And if it is, do all these properties match? Finally, I have a toString method, which is a standard thing. And when I do string concatenation with a shoe object, it's going to call that and print out that phrase. So here I'm creating three shoe objects. Here I'm checking to see if I've created any, and of course I have. And then I want to know how many. Now this shoe.count is not protected in any way. I could set that to a different value, but being a good citizen, it will only get incremented when I call the shoe constructor. So I've created three shoe objects. Here I'm exercising the uh, two string method. And then I'm comparing some of my shoes. Is S1 the same as S2? No, one's Mizuno, one's Nike. How about S1 and S3? Well, those are the same. They're not the same object in memory, but they're both shoe objects, and they have matching properties, and so I'm considering those to be equal. So there's a simple example of defining a class. Yes? So, so there's nothing in this class syntax that lets you do that. However, you can use things from ES5 to, to make variables that are private, and you can do some things with, uh, um, I'm losing the term. Uh, it, you can hide variables in a closure. That's what I was looking for. You could put them in a closure and make them uh, private in that way. But there's nothing in the new class syntax to support that. No, you can't declare variables inside the class. Just cons one constructor and any number of methods that you want. That would be nice to have that. Yes? Uh, you have to take care of that yourself. And so if you want to maybe use the rest parameter there and take any number of arguments and then figure out what they mean, you can do that. Yeah. So here's an example of a class that inherits from another one. I have a running shoe class that extends shoe. And interestingly, that thing after extends can be uh, uh, any expression. Uh, it doesn't have to just be the name of a constructor, but often it will be. And so I'm uh, using super to pass the first three parameters to my super class constructor. And then I'm holding on to the type. And of course, this is a brand new shoe, so I haven't run in this running shoe yet, so the number of miles is zero. I have a method to add miles to the shoe, and I can ask whether it's time to replace it, which is a good idea after about 500 miles. So create a running shoe, 
add some miles to it, ask whether I should replace it, no, not yet, add more miles, and now I should replace it. So inside a constructor uh, for a class that extends another one, you have to call super before you access this. If I reverse those two lines in the constructor, that would break, and that's because it's actually the super class constructor that creates the object and sets this. You try to access this before it, it isn't defined yet. So if I write a class that doesn't extend another one, and I don't write a constructor explicitly, it acts like I wrote that, just an empty constructor. If I have a class that does extend from another one, and I don't write a constructor, it acts like I have this. And this is kind of interesting. It's using the rest operator to say, let's gather up all the arguments you passed in. And then using the spread operator here to say, let's call the superclass constructor, spread them out, pass them all up to the superclass. So that's what you get by default. You can inherit from some built-in classes like array and error, but this is not something that a transpiler can help you with. So you really can't do that until the browsers support that or uh, an environment like Node. Class definitions are block scoped. If you declare a class inside a block, it can't be used outside the block. They are not hoisted. So if I'm in a block and I declare a class in the middle of the block, I can't use the class before that. It doesn't hoist the definition up to the top. And it's evaluated in strict mode without me even asking for it. Everything I do inside a class definition is in ES5 strict mode and has to live by those rules. Okay, so I really want to make sure I get to some important things at the end. So I'm going to go really fast through some slides here and get us up to talking about iterables. So there's some new methods and properties added in math and number and string. There's template literals where I use back ticks instead of single ticks or double quotes. And inside I can use expressions with the dollar curly brace and then a closed curly brace and it evaluates those expressions and builds a resulting string for me. And I can even have new line characters inside the back tick, so I get to have multi-line strings. There are tag template literals where I specify before this back tick string a name of a function. And that function will get invoked with uh, two things. There's a collection of pieces that they call raw and another collection that they call cooked. The raw pieces of this string are hello space and then this space here and this exclamation point. The cooked pieces are the values of these expressions. And these are the cooked pieces right there. And they actually come in as separate parameters. But if I want them to be in an array, I can use the rest uh, syntax to get that. And then these are the raw pieces. And then you take all the, the, those two arrays and combine them however you want and return a string. And that's what gets outputted here. So in this case, all I'm doing is uppercasing all of the values and keeping the raw parts the same. But you could use this for all kinds of things like uh, language translations or different kinds of encodings. I have one more example here called ddent that uh, I found uh, on somebody's website. I forget who created this. But the point is I might want to write one of these backtick strings in this way so that all the pieces line up. But I don't really want all these spaces in my resulting string, and so it strips those out. That's what my ddent function at the top does. There's some additions to the array class, like find and find index, where you give it a predicate function, and it returns back to you either the first element that matches that, where the predicate returns true, or the index of the first one that matches. And notice we have these methods, entries, keys, and values. And what's really significant is that some of the new collection classes like map and set have those same methods for uh, consistency of the API. Some new uh, functions on object, and the most significant of those is assign. Assign lets you give it a target object and any number of other objects, and it's going to copy properties from the source objects into the target. Uh, so if a property is already in target, it will replace that. Okay, so the order of those source objects is significant. It starts from the left, replaces properties in the target, then it goes to the next source object and the next one, or overlaying anything that exists. So this means that you could use it for making a shallow clone of an object really easily. So here I've got an object, and I just want to copy all of its properties into this empty object 
and get the result back, and there I have cloned it. But of course, if any of those properties referred to an object or an array, I just copied a reference to it. That's why I say it's a shallow clone. So what kind of object is copy? Well, it's just a generic object. Well, what if my object I was cloning was one of those shoe objects? My clone doesn't know that anymore, and I can't call any of the shoe methods. So I could fix that like this. I could write my own clone function, and the first thing I would do is grab the prototype of the object you passed in. Then I could create a brand new empty object that has that as its prototype, and then I'll assign into that one and return it. And so now the object I get back knows what its type is. It's the same type as the one that I passed in. Another use for this is inside a constructor. So we saw this code earlier where I'm taking in parameters in my constructor and then I just assign to properties in this new object I'm creating. But a shorter way to do that would be to replace all of these lines with this. Notice what I'm doing here is I'm using an enhanced object literal to create an object where these are the keys and they are the values set from these parameters coming in. And then I just assign that to this. And it's really doing the same thing as all of these lines. Okay, it's not so impressive in this example because I only have three, but suppose I had seven of these, then the difference in the line count would be more extreme. And then one last example, uh, I wanna add to this object default values for some of its properties, but if it already has the property, I don't want to use the default. So what I could do is have this set of defaults and my target is this empty object. So the first thing I do is add to that object my defaults. And the second thing I do is take all the properties in this object and overlay those. So if it had a color or a size, it would overlay it. Otherwise, I still have the default. So that's a great way to add defaults to an existing object. Four of loops. So uh, this is significant because it works with anything that is iterable, which of course includes arrays. And so in this very simple example, I have an array of names of the three stooges, and then I'm iterating through these. And you might look at this and think, well, shouldn't I use the array for each method? Or shouldn't I use an old style loop? But again, the key here is that this doesn't just work with arrays, it can be anything that is iterable, and you might decide to change what kind of collection you're using later, and then this code wouldn't break, okay? Um, now, that entries method that I briefly uh, pointed out earlier, uh, that returns uh, an iterable, and so I can use that with the uh, uh, for of loop, and it gives me back these arrays uh, where I get an index and a value, and it just iterates through all of those. Okay, so there's new collection classes, sets and maps, and you're probably familiar with how sets and maps work. The big thing here uh, where you might want to use a map instead of just a plain JavaScript object is that in a map, the keys can be any kind of value, whereas in a plain object, they have to be strings. So it's a big advantage of using maps. And then there's weak set and weak map, where if that uh, key gets taken out, or let me rephrase that, if there's nothing else in my running application that refers to the object that is that key, it can be garbage collected, even though that weak map or weak set was still referring to it. And so it's often used for caching kinds of situations. So sets do all the things you would expect. You can add something to the set. You can check whether something is there, delete something, remove everything. And then it has these same methods that we saw in the array class, uh, entries, values, and keys. Of course, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a set. What's the difference between a key and a value in a set? They're really the same thing. And so that's what it gives you. These are iterating over the same things. And when you ask for the entries, you get pairs of a value and a value where they're the same thing just for consistency of the API. And of course, that makes more sense for a map where you're getting back uh, key value pairs. Another interesting thing here is that when you use these to iterate through what you have in a set or a map, it does it in insertion order. So that's kind of surprising that it remembered the order in which you added things to the map and you get them back out in that same order. All right, promises. So promises 
are a, a proxy that represents some value that you will have in the future. They're often used when you're working with REST services and you want to make this asynchronous call to the REST service and then later, if that worked, the, re the REST call worked, you'll get that resolved. Otherwise, it might be rejected uh, if there's an error. So what you do with the promise is you call then on it and you pass to then one or two callback functions. The first one is for success and the second one is for an error. Uh, the success callback can be invoked with any kind of value, whatever the promise resolved with. Reject is often invoked with an error object, but it really could be any kind of value. Uh, there is also a catch method, which is like then, but it just takes the failure callback, not a success one. And there is an advantage in using then with only a success and then chain on to that a call with catch with only an error and uh, error callback. And the difference is explained in this box here. If I do it this way and I pass it a success callback and an error callback, suppose inside uh, the success callback it throws, what will happen? Well, the answer is that that's going to be silently ignored. On the other hand, if I did it this way and I just give the success call back and then I chain on a call to catch and I throw in here, oh, well, that'll end up in the catch and I can deal with it there. So it's slightly better to do it that way. Uh, there's a good possibility that ES2016 is going to add another method uh, to then and catch, add a finally method for some code that you want to run in either case. You can call then on a pro um, promise even after it has been resolved. The promise still knows what it resolved to, and so it will just call the callback immediately and give it whatever the result was. So there's three possible states that a promise is in. Uh, either it's pending, or it's been resolved, or it's been rejected. Once it's resolved or rejected, that's it. It will always stay in that state. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in two more slides. Yeah, I'll get to that. Uh, so here's an example of uh, using a promise. So I have to create a brand new promise object, and I'm passing to it uh, a function that has two arguments, a resolve and a reject. And my job is to call resolve if everything works out, or call reject if there's a problem. So presumably, I'm now going to do something asynchronous, and at some point later, I will call resolve or reject. But in this toy example, there's nothing really asynchronous here. I'm just checking to see, did you pass me something that was a number? And if it was, I'm going to resolve with the number times two. Otherwise, I'm going to reject and say that that thing wasn't a number. So I now have a function that returns a promise. So I'm calling it here. So then I need to call then on the promise that got returned. And I pass to then two callbacks using arrow functions. So this is when it's successful, and I print that out. And if there's an error, I print that. Very simple. Uh, often, uh, the UI person might be working ahead of the back end people. The back end people are supposed to implement this REST service, but they haven't done it yet. And so what do you do when you're working on the UI? Well, you kind of want to fake this out for now. And so your uh, function like this one that was going to return a promise and call their REST service, what you'll do instead is this, promise.resolve and give it some dummy data. And then your UI works. And then later, you'll get rid of that and actually call the REST service. Or you could even simulate what would happen if it didn't work and call promise.reject and give it an error object. And you can test out that scenario. Sometimes you want to do multiple asynchronous things. And then you don't want to proceed until they all finish. And so you can use promise.all and pass it an iterable. Most often, this is going to be an array of promises, but it can be any iterable thing that has promises. So it's just waiting for all of them to be resolved. And what you'll get back is an array of all of the results in the order that you specified the promises. Uh, or if any of them are rejected, then the error callback will be invoked. And, uh, kind of a counterpart to this, promise.race, you give it a bunch of promises, and it's just waiting for the first one to either resolve or reject. And when that happens, the promise that this returns 
resolves or rejects with the same value. So those are all the kind of utility methods that are provided. Uh, so here's the chaining example. So a big thing to think about here is that in a success callback, you should do one of three things. Either you uh, return a value, or you could return a promise, because you want to do something else asynchronous now, or you can throw, because something went wrong. So if you return a promise, then the promise that uh, that then returned will resolve with that same value. And that's what we see happening up here. I'm calling my async double and passing it one, and then I call then on it. So if that works, which it should in this case, it's gonna resolve with the number two. And so that's what's passed in as V there. And then I turn around and say, well, what I wanna return is another call to async double, and I pass it in the two. Well, that returned a promise, which means that the first then will resolve with whatever that promise resolves to. So it resolves uh, to uh, uh, four. And so now that next V is four. And then I do it again, and that resolves to eight, and then I print out the result. Now, if I uh, uncomment that line that's commented out there, and I pass it in a bad string, well, that's going to cause it to skip this next then, and it will go down to the catch. As soon as anything rejects, it'll go to the first error handler that's in the chain and let that handle it. Interestingly, it's possible to recover from an error like that. If the uh, callback for the error returns a value or returns another promise, we're gonna keep going and there could be other things chained on there. But if it throws, uh, then that's the end of it. Okay. All right, so I wish I had time to talk about modules, but unfortunately I need to skip past this. Uh, grab my slides or find me at lunch and we can talk about this more. But I really want to talk about iter iterators and iterables a bit more. So an iterator is an object that visits uh, elements in some sequence. And we talked about how arrays can be used with this. And the key thing about an iterator is it's just an object, any kind of object that has a next method. And we'll talk about what that next method does on the next slide. An iterable is an object that has a method whose name is the value of symbol.iterator. Now it's possible for an object to be both of these things, to be an iterator and an iterable. And in fact, it's a common thing to do. And this is what it would look like. If I take an object and I grab the value of symbol.iterator, and that's a, a method, and I call it, it returns something. And if what it gives me back is that same object, that means the object is trying to act as both iterable and an iterator. And of course, in that case, it has to also have a next method. That's what makes it an uh, iterator. So array and set and map, they all do that. They're iterable and they're iterators. So here's what the next method does. It gets the next value in a sequence, and what it gives you back is not just the value, but you get an object that has two properties, a value and a done property. And done means you've hit the end of the sequence. Now, interestingly, uh, what are you supposed to do when done is true? Should you use the value or should you not? Well, that isn't specified in the spec. So when you're writing your own iterators, you can do whatever you want. But it turns out that in all the parts of the language that do something with an iterator, like the for of loop, they do not use the value if done is set to true. Another question is if you're writing your own iterable and you're returning these objects that have uh, value and done properties, could you just reuse the same object, keep returning the same object over and over again, but change the values of properties inside it? And the answer is yes, you can do that, but you're kind of living on the edge if you do. And the reason is that the thing that is invoking your iterator, it might be caching those values that are returned and then looking at them later, and then you change the values out from under it. And that's what all these boxes are about, is trying to explain that. So in general, your next method should always return a new object on every call. Uh, so lots of things are iterable uh, in ES6. We talked about arrays and sets and maps, and even node list from the DOM is becoming iterable. I don't know that all the browsers have implemented that yet, but that's certainly in the plans. Primitive strings are iterable over their code points. By code points, I mean UTF-8 characters. It knows how to walk through those regardless of how many bytes they take. 
All of these methods that we saw in the array and the set and the map classes return iterators and your custom objects can be made iterable. You just need to add a method whose name is the value of symbol.iterator. Ordinary objects are not iterable, but you can make them that way yourself. And here's an example that shows that. And really the purpose of this code is to show you how to make something, anything, iterable. So I have this function and it returns a thing that is iterable. And how do I know that? Well, I know it because I'm returning this object and you look at this line right here, I'm creating a method whose name is the value of symbol.iterator. And it's just returning the current object. The current object has a method called next. So that means this object I'm creating is both iterable and it's an iterator. And the next method has to return those objects that have uh, value and done properties. And I'm doing that. I started index at zero. I've grabbed all the keys. In this case, I'm using something that gives me every key, even if it's a symbol. If you only wanted the kind of regular keys, you could use that method instead. And then I'm checking to see if I've made it to the end. And if I have, I'm returning a brand new object that just says done is true. I don't have to set a value because it's not going to be used in that case. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to grab the key at that index and, and I'll also bump up the index and then grab the value for that key. And then I'm returning a value, which is this array that I get the key value pair. And I don't say done is false. I don't need to do that because remember done being undefined is treated the same as false. And so now I have this object and I can use my object entries function to get an uh, iter iterable. And that's what I need to use the for of loop. And here I'm using destructuring to get the keys and the values and then I can just print them out. So it's really easy to take any object and make it be iterable or make it be an iterator, just the way I showed there. Okay, so I'm really running out of time here, so I need to go quick. I want to point out that there are a lot of things that are consumerable, consumers of iterables. There's the for of loop, the spread operator. There's uh, uh, used in a couple of different ways here uh, as parameters or creating an array. Positional destructuring uses iterables. I can pass an iterable to the constructor for a set to pre-populate it with all the things in an iterable. I can do the same kind of thing with a map where I give it an iterable over key value pairs that are arrays of those two things. The promise all and race methods, you can pass it anything that's iterable to get a collection of all the promises that you want to wait for. And then generators with yield star do a kind of special thing with iterables that I'll skip over for now. Uh, so here's another example of an iterator the classic Fibonacci example. So here I have just an object. I'm creating a literal object and you can tell that it's iterable because it has that method symbol.iterator. And uh, so I'm grabbing uh, the next values in the Fibonacci sequence. And so I just need to add the previous and the current value and put that over in current and then return that. And in my short way of implementing this, if you're uh, an expert at Fibonacci, you'll see that I've omitted the first couple of values, but forgetting that, the rest of the values are correct. And an interesting thing about this is that uh, uh, it's never going to stop. I never set done to true. But that's fine. I can have an infinite sequence here. And so when I call it in the for of loop, it's just going to go on forever, which is why I have this check here to say stop after I get past 100. Uh, here's another example that shows how you can make things uh, somewhat more efficient by using an iterable. Uh, so I've got an array and I have a function that will tell me whether a value is odd. And what I want to do is print out all the things that are odd from that array. And so in my first attempt at solving this in that one line, uh, I'm going to do a filter and the filter is going to create a brand new array of just the odd values. Then I'll use for each to loop through those and print them out. The problem with this is that if this is a really large array, I'm not printing out anything until I have found all the odd ones. And then I start printing. But I don't want that. I want to print them out as I find them. And so I could do that by using an iterable. So here I have a function where I can pass it an array and a filter. And it returns an iterable. And uh, that returns an object that has a next method. And I could say, if I've hit the end, I'm done. 
Otherwise, grab the next value in the array, and if it passes the filter, then return that. But otherwise, just keep looping, and maybe I'll hit the end, or maybe I'll eventually find something that matches the filter. And now, when I use this for of loop, and I say in the loop that I want to print out the value, it prints the odd values as it finds them. I don't have to put them all into an array first and then start printing. So it's a lot more code to get that, but uh, if that's the behavior I want, that's a nice way to get it. Uh, one, oh well, two more topics I want to try to race through here. Generators. Uh, generators uh, are functions, there's a generator function that returns a generator. A generator is a special kind of an iterator. And the magical thing about these is that you use the yield keyword inside them to give out multiple results. And so it's a function that can be called multiple times. And in a sense, it kind of remembers where it left off. And it can pick up there again when you invoke it again. Uh, you can exit a generator in multiple ways. You could do it by running off the end of your function. Uh, you could do it by returning a specific value with a return keyword. Or if you throw an error, you'll exit out. Generators are used in two primary ways. You can use it as a producer. It's producing a bunch of values. Or you could use it as consumer, where you're giving data to it, and it uses it in its next calculation. The difference uh, between a generator and a normal function is that asterisk that you put after the function keyword. And then inside the code, you'll use the yield keyword. And you can even make methods in a class uh, be generator methods. Uh, I'm going to skip over this slide. These are things that are really important for slide 58, but you could read up on that later. Um, so the key thing here is that you call a generator function. It returns a generator. Because that's a special kind of iterator, you could use it with the for of loop. And uh, because it's an iterator, that means it has a next method. And so you're using it kind of in the same way that we saw earlier. So here's a really basic generator. Uh, you see the asterisk there, and I'm yielding two things, and I'm returning one. So if I call that function, I get a generator, which is an iterator, so I can call next on it. And when I do that, I get the first value, and done is false. And I call it again, and I get the next value, and done is false. And when I call it the third time, I get that value that was returned, and now done is true. But remember, when done is true, all the built-in things in ES6 are going to ignore that value. So if I use this uh, uh, for of loop, I'm going to get 1, and then I'll get 2. But I won't see 3. It won't evaluate that because done is true. If I remove the return statement from that, uh, then I won't get that last value. OK, so I need to wrap up here. But uh, here's an example of. Uh, uh, the Fibonacci thing using a generator. So look over that and catch me and let me know if you have questions about that. Uh, one of the key things about generators is that you could use it as a way of making a, a flow of async things look kind of synchronous. And this example shows how to do that, but it's kind of messy. What you really want is these new keywords that are being added in the next version of JavaScript. ES 2016, the async and await keywords. These things are magical. And you actually can use them today if you're using a transpiler. And so I have a code example of that. Uh, but take a look at this part of the code where I'm calling a bunch of these functions. And I have await on all of them. And notice that I'm inside a try catch here. This is great because if something goes wrong in these asynchronous functions, I can catch it and deal with that. And that's something that you really can't do with just callbacks. So I encourage you to start using some of these features today. As I said, you can use transpilers for this. I have a list of features you might want to consider using. And this list is based on uh, things that the, tr the, tra the transpilers support today and also things that you can check your code for using something like ESLint or JSHint. And so they're kind of safe to use today. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. And catch me in the cafeteria if you want to talk more.